Namo Buddhaya, this is Abhinav and I welcome you. Uh, in this video, we are discussing the, uh, uh, my learnings, I'm discussing my learnings from the Middle Discourses 22, uh, given by the Buddha. The name of the discourse is the simile of the cobra or the simile of the snake, right? So, uh, the link to the entire discourse is given in the description. You can read that at your end. Uh, I'm covering the main, main points. It's a long discourse. It is like eight pages discourse. So let me cover the main main things that are coming out in this discourse, right? So basically it starts with, the discourse starts with a mendicant named Aritha who had previously been a vulture trapper. Now this mendicant was like spreading wrong things about the Buddha, right? So basically that uh, the Buddha, he, he says, as I understand the Buddha's teaching, the acts that he says are obstructions, are not really obstructions for the one who performs them. So several mendicants, they went up to him and said, this is wrong that you are saying, you do not misrepresent the Buddha, right? Misrepresenting the Buddha will cause you suffering only. So he was not, you know, he did not, uh, uh, he was not uh, uh, agreeing to relent. So then Buddha called him, right? Buddha summoned him. So, uh, so he came and Buddha summoned him and then he was, he sat on one side and the Buddha said, uh, boss, what are you doing, right? You are spreading this harmful uh, kind of a kind of conception. That obstructions are not obstructions. You are, you know, what I am teaching. You are, you know, uh, saying that uh, something else. So, so this is what Buddha said. Silly man, who on earth have you ever known me to teach in that way? Haven't I said in many ways that obstructions act as obstru uh, obstructive acts are obstructive, and that they really do obstruct the one who performs them? I said that sensual pleasures give little gratification and much suffering and distress. And they are all the more full of drawbacks. With the similes of skeletons, scrap of meat, grass torch, pit of glowing coals, dream, borrowed goods, fruit on a tree, butcher's knife and chopping blocks, talking sword, snake's head. I said that sensual pleasures give little gratification and much suffering and distress. And they are all the more full of drawbacks. But still you misrepresent me by your wrong grass, harm yourself and create much wickedness. This will be for your lasting harm and suffering. Then Buddha turned towards the mendicants and said, What do you think, mendicants? This Aritha monk, he, has he even, ha, has he even a spark of ardor in, his, in this teaching and training? So they said, no. And Aritha like sat dismayed and he realized that, you know, I made a mistake. So, so then, then Buddha continues his teaching. And, and then Buddha says that, Take a foolish person who memorizes the teaching, whatever is it, your like statements, mixed pros and words, discussions, verses, etc. But doesn't examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. So don't come to a considered acceptance of them. They memorize the teaching for the sake of finding fault and winning debates. They don't realize the goal for which they must memorize them. Because they are wrongly grasped, those teachings lead to their lasting harm and suffering. Why is that? Because of their wrong grasp of the teachings. Now Buddha talk gives the example of a cobra. That's why this discourse is named the simile of the cobra. So, so Buddha says, suppose the person uh, uh, wants to catch a cobra and he grasps the big cobra by the coil or a tail, but the cobra twists back and bite his hand or arm or limb and results in death of the person. Why? Because the grasp of that person on the cobra was wrong, right? Because he should have known that the cobra would have bought, uh, bitten him. Right? In the same way, a foolish person memorized the teachings for the, all the wrong reasons and these and memorizing the teachings in the, such way leads to their lasting harm and suffering because of their wrong grasp. Similar way, Buddha is now giving the example, reverse example, that a person who understands the teaching examines the meaning with wisdom, right, and comes to a considered acceptance of them. He doesn't memorize the teaching for the sake of finding fault or winning debates. He realizes the goal. What is the goal, friends? What is the goal? Buddha always said the goal is arihantship, becoming totally free of defilement. That has to be our one goal when we are in the Buddha's teaching. So he realizes the goal for which he memorizes them. Because they are correctly grasped, those teachings lead to lasting welfare and happiness. Why is that? Because of his correct grasp on the teachings. So Buddha now gives the example of the cobra that when they co see the cobra, they hold it carefully with a cleft stick. Only then they would correctly grasp it by the neck. Even though that cobra might ras wrap its coils around that person's hands or arm or some other link, that wouldn't result in death. Why is that? Because they are correct grasp. 
So this is what as students we have to remember. Lot of you know people what I also see, you know they get stuck in these you know narrow misconceptions, narrow things about you know what the, the actual meaning of this sentence is. They said they know what is the meaning, still they keep on debating, right? Because of their arrogance and they want to establish and you know that uh, uh, their point of view is right. So they are like missing the whole thing. So uh, so it's very important that we keep our focus on the goal and keep doing what Buddha wants us to do rather than engage in these harmful debates and which will not serve any purpose. Okay? Then Buddha gives example of the uh, simile of a teaching as a raft. But it's a beautiful ra uh, teaching. So Buddha says that suppose a person was traveling and they see a large deluge uh, and uh, deluge means water, uh, uh, right? And they think that I will kind of get, get the grass sticks, branches and leaves and make a raft to cross to the other shore of the river. And they, they, cross, the, and they cross the other shore and then they think this raft has been very helpful to me. Uh, why don't I hoist it on the top of my head and pick up on my shoulder wherever I go, right? So Buddha said, what do you think? Is he doing right? So, so mendicants said, no, this is wrong, right? Once you are through to the other shore, then you need to drop the raft because then what's the point of carrying? <coughs> right? So Buddha said, uh, in the same way, I have taught this simile of teaching as a raft for crossing over, not for holding on. By understanding the simile of the raft, you will even give up the teachings, let alone what is against the teachings. Right? So let alone whatever is against the teachings, you will even give up the teachings once you realize then you have to even drop that, right? Okay. Then Buddha talks about the wrong and the right view of the self, right? So there are, I think, there are like um, quite a few uh, learnings from this particular discourse on various other different different topics. So Buddha says, what are the six grounds of views? So Buddha says, a person, unlearned person. So here Buddha is talking about the wrong view of the self. So that unlearned person, what he thinks, form as this is mine, this is self. They also regard feelings, perceptions, choices, consciousness as the same. That this is mine and this is myself. At, uh, this cosmos and the self are only one and the same. After death, I will be permanent, everlasting, eternal, imperishable and will last forever and ever. Right. So that is all the wrong view of the self. Right. Then Buddha said, what is the right view of the self? The right view of the self is, this is not mine, I am not this. This is not myself. All the feelings, perceptions, choices, consciousness, whatever is seen, heard, thought, known, attained, this is not mine. I am not this. This is not myself. Right? After they do not think like this, that cosmos and self are one and the same. So this is the teachings which, is, which directly contradict the Vedas. And that's why Buddha said that whole the teaching of the Vedas on one permanent self is wrong. There is no permanent self. Right? It's just a play of elements and the dependent origination happening. Right? Do not get stuck into anything that you think as one self. It's just a play of elements. And when you realize that everything is just a play of elements, then you become free. All the anxiety goes away. Right? Then Buddha says that their can mendicant says uh, it's when uh, so mendicant asks the question, sir, can there be anxiety about what doesn't exist? Uh, so, so Buddha says, seeing this way, that nothing is mine, nothing is myself. They are not anxious in any any way. So Buddha says, sir, there can still can, there can be some anxiety about what doesn't exist externally. There can mendicant said the Buddha. It's when someone thinks, oh, it was once mine, but now more. It could be mine, but I do not get it. The sorrow and wail and lament beating their breast and falling into confusion. That is how is anxiety about what doesn't exist externally. Right? So sim similar things Buddha is saying that right? How, can there be no anxiety about what does not exist in internally? There can when someone doesn't have a view the cosmos and self are one and the same. After that I will be permanent ever everlasting. They hear the realized ones of their disciples teaching the Dhamma for uprooting of all grounds, fixations. So what this is our practice. This practice that we do of mindfulness through of Vipassana is of this practice of mindfulness is to get that Vipassana, get that insight 
that we uproot all these obsessions, fixations, insistences, underlying tendencies regarding the views for the stilling of all activities, letting go of all attachments, ending of craving, fading away, cessation and extinguishment. They don't think, oh, I am going to be annihilated and destroyed. I won't exist anymore. They don't sorrow and wail and lament, beating their breast and falling into confusion. That's how there is no anxiety about what doesn't exist internally. Internally. So then there is some questions, right? Uh, so mannequins, would it? It would make sense to be possessive about question. Buddha is, is asking question. It, it would make sense to be possessive about something that's permanent, everlasting, eternal, and imperishable. But do you see any such possession? Mannequin said no, because everything is impermanent. So Buddha said, good mannequins, I also cannot see any such possession. It would make sense to grasp at the doctrine of self that didn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness. But do you see any such doctrine of self? No, because any doctrine of self would ultimately lead to sorrow. So mendicants said, no sir, there is no such doctrine that doesn't lead to sorrow. Good mendicants, I also cannot see any such doctrine of self. It would make sense to rely on a view that doesn't give rise to sorrow. So, do you see any view such such view to rely on? No, because if you have any such view on self, please remember, friends, if you have a view that there is a permanent self, you will always be bound. You will always be bound to suffering, right? Only when you realize that this is just a play of the elements, there is no permanent self. Then only we can be free of you know whatever we think are the problems, our separatedness from you know everything else. This is what Buddha's teaching is. Everything is in everything else. There is no separate self. Till the time I feel that I have a separate self, that till that time only I have all the anxiety. Right? Mendicants, were a self to exist, would there be a thought belonging to myself? Yes, sir. Were what being belongs to a self to exist, would there be the thought myself? Yes, sir. But since a self and what belongs to the self are not actually found, is not the following a totally foolish teaching? The cosmos and self are one. After that, I will be impermanent. Right? So, mendicant said, Absolutely, sir, you are right. It's a foolish teaching. Then, what do you think, mendicants? Is form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, sir. But if it's impermanent, is it suffering or happiness? Suffering, sir. But if it's impermanent, suffering and perishable, is it fit to be regarded as this is mine, I am this, this is myself? No, sir. What do you think, mendicants? Is feeling, perception, choice, consciousness permanent? Impermanent. Impermanent, suffering, same thing Buddha is saying, talking about other aggregates as well. So, Buddha is saying, so mannequins, you should truly see any kind of form, past, future, present, internal, external, coarse or fine, inferior, superior, far or near, all form with right understanding. This is not mine. I am not this. This is not myself. You should tru truly see any kind of feeling, perception, choices, consciousness with the same way. So, seeing this, a learned noble disciple grows disillusioned with form, feelings, perceptions, choices and consciousness. Being disillusioned, the desires fade away. When desires fade away, they are freed. When they are freed, they know they are freed. So this is very deep actually. This, this. Then, then there is this thing about uh, if others honor, respect, revere and venerate them, he doesn't get thrilled, elated and emotionally excited. If they praise him, he just thinks they just do these things regarding what the past was completely understood. So, but there's one more advice is, if others abuse or attack, harass, trouble you, don't make yourself resentful, bitter and emotionally exasperated. Or if others honor, respect you, then also don't be emotionally excited. Then Buddha says, mendicants, give up what isn't yours. Giving it up will be for your lasting welfare. And what isn't yours? Form is not yours. Feelings are not yours. No, this uh, uh, mental volitions are not yours, choice is not yours. Okay? All the five aggregates. Giving up, feeling, perception, choices, consciousness isn't yours. Give it up. It will be for your lasting happiness. Right? So this is Middle Discourses 22. I've just tried to capture the main, main kind of learnings. So it gives a very good view of, first of all, how we should understand the teaching. We should not wrongly grasp the teaching. We should have the right view of the self, right? These like two main things and we should give up all our desires, at attachments. So what we have to do, we have to practice more and more mindfulness. With more mindfulness, our mind gets more and more concentrated and we will be able to be able to get the insight into the reality of this existence that everything is changing. 
nothing we can latch on to and uh, once we get that understanding we are freed from all anxiety all suffering right so this was it do uh, uh, share your thoughts and learnings in the comment section namo buddhaya namo buddha